Welcome back. We're looking at the changing media landscape and whether the rules governor, governing it are appropriate at the moment. Richard Ackland, I want to go back to you and just picking up on what we've heard tonight, uh, Glenn Boron, the, the chair of the Convergence Review, uh, talking about this industry body that will look at news and commentary and, and police that, uh, essentially. But then if there is persistent misbehaviour, referring that to a government body, what do you think of that? Is, is there cause for concern there? I personally don't think there's cause for concern. I think if you look at the most recent awful instances of media behaviour... And what have they been? They've all been breaches of privacy. They've been the, um, <clears throat> the Clive James story on Channel 9 a couple of weeks ago where alleged former lover of Clive James was taken to London by Channel 9 and, and uh, popped him in a street in Cambridge and mm. um, confronted him about this affair, which is a pretty gross and appalling invasion of privacy. There was the um, Lara Bingle in the nude on Channel 9. She'd come out of the shower in her apartment in Bondi, went to um, the window to close the curtains and a paparazzi um, snapped her, was put on Channel 9. And with the, you know, incredible explanation that we're putting this on, uh, um, on television because we disapprove of what paparazzis and the awful things they're doing. <laughs> In the national interest, too. Um, there, there was, of course, the David Campbell case, the New mm. South Wales minister who was uh, pinged by Channel 7 outside a, a men's only sauna facility. And um, See, what happens with these well, cases these, at the moment? Are, these are exactly the sort of case... I mean, you would think, in the face of all this concern about media behaviour and all the um, hacking stuff that's going on in England and the sort of last-chance saloon sort of atmosphere that exists, mm -hmm. that Channel 9 might have pulled its head in on a story like the Clive James, but not at all. But do, I don't think they get the message. Does no, anything, journalists don't get it. Does anything happen to them at the moment? <clears throat> well, if someone complains eventually to, act, uh, to the... Um, uh, act, yeah, to the regulator, to the broadcasting regulator, <laughs> down the track, I mean, it took some time in the David mm. Campbell case to get a result, which was an appalling, absurd decision. So you think there needs to be a bigger stick and, and possibly a government <coughs> no, will the bigger stick? I think there needs to be uh, a proper code of conduct. When I mean, there is a code of conduct, there's various mm. codes of conduct. I think the code of conduct has got to be respected and it's got to be enforced in some way. But Journalists David, don't respect it. I would mm. argue that those <coughs> cases are more the rarity and look I'm not trying to apologise for anyone mm. I've sat in that current affair chair and I've also sat on in and mm. done stories on a very reputable program on Sunday and that sort of thing but I think they're more the uh, the aberration mm. they are not the norm of what so many journalists and what so much of our media is filled with which is they're trying to exact very good standards. Sure but there needs to be a way of dealing with misbehaviour doesn't there? Well don't we deal with that already or well, are you saying that we that not yeah. enough because these few examples well, have I've got through. Meeting, yeah. meeting somebody with a feather. That's, that's <laughs> exactly what um, other professions and other occupations would say to journalists. When you find something that's wrong in those professions or occupations, they'd say it doesn't happen very often and you wouldn't buy the argument that that didn't mean that, that something significant needs to be done about it. No, but I think, I think there is a major, there are major concerns about media standards and we need to be frank about that. And one of the problems is that um, people in the community, including community leaders don't speak out about mm. this partly because they, they feel and I think they're often quite justified in feeling that it won't help them in their future uh, relations with the media. We at the Press Council conducted a number of community consultations last year with community leaders uh, and it was no surprise to me that a number of them said that and that's it's interesting that you've had virtually no comment from community leaders on mm. the Finkelstein People Convergence are too Review. To bag the media. Yeah, but I, mm. I want to also emphasise I think we're focusing too much on a government industry dichotomy. Mm. That's really not not the range of choice. There's a spectrum and this is very fully recognised in the United Kingdom where they've been really mugged by reality and they're having to really think through the options. Mm. And for example Alan Rusbridge of The Guardian, the editor there, he's spelled out how there's a, there's a spectrum. At one end there's total self-regulation. At the other end there's a, a statutory authority pretty much like we now have in broadcasting. 
towards the self-regulation end, but not at that end, is the press council as it now is. We have a considerable element of independence, and I agree with Glenn's um, reforms, but with respect, I don't agree with his description of them. Um, it isn't an industry body that, that he has proposed, in my view. I don't think it's even really an industry-led body. Um, it does involve, for example, um, statutory compulsion to be a member of it for, for, for some organisations. It involves statutory incentives to be a member of it for others. Uh, it involves, I think, a majority of non-media people, uh, as is the case with the Press Council, adjudicating on complaints. This is, I think, what we need as a body which is independent of government and sufficiently independent of the profession. Oh, sorry, I, I like, I'm quite happy to call it a profession, but I know journalists don't like that, many of them. Independent of the industry to command public confidence. Who so it's not people? government or industry. Who are these people? Who, Sorry, which people? The, 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 the journalist body. No. Uh, well, who about, are these people who are going to uh, set the standards, right. uh, tell people whether they're abiding by the standards? Well, we have it now, George. Wrestling, we're wrestling with a column of smoke here. I mean, no, we well, have it now, George. I mean, the, the, the Press Council now has public members on it. The publishers comprise one-third of the members of the Press Council. I'm the chair. The vice chair is also a public member, not chosen by publishers. We have it now. Now, the council hasn't performed well enough, um, but its structures and its processes are basically quite good. Mm. The method of selection uh, is capable of being good. Uh, it applies in some other countries. It's Ireland a cross has a the community similar community you end up on the No, I don't. I, for some purposes, cross section of the community, but some of these issues are extremely uh, difficult to think your way through, and you do need people who are experienced in analysing issues, and you also, frankly, need people who are strong and confident enough to hold their position in discussions which can be get very vigorous around the table well, one of, with one senior of the, media people. One of the issues, uh, the differences between the way the Press Council works at the moment and, and the body that you've recommended. Mm -hmm is that uh, media companies can walk away from right. the press council. Mm -hmm. West Australian newspapers has mm -hmm. recently done that. Mm -hmm. You want them compelled to be a part of this body, but how, how would you do that? So, so, so we've set some thresholds that have recommendations in the report that says if you're big, sky, scale and scope, and uh, it covers about 15 of the most substantial sure, media Sure, so if reports. News Limited, for example, said we're not going to be a part of it, what, they're, what happens? they're compelled. There will be that, that is the one. How, how are they compelled? They'll, they'll, they'll be, uh, how be, are they compelled? Be, be, there'll be there'll be there'll be a, there'll be statute. There'll be law that says if you're if you're measured in so this. So if, if News Limited or Fairfax yep. or Channel Nine says we disagree fundamentally with where this industry body's taking, yep. we're not going to be a part. Their, of their role is what, within, can, what will their, the government their, do? Their role is within, not without. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the situation today where the industry can say, we want to self-regulate, we will take our own responsibility for our um, standards, mm -hmm. but as Julian well knows, it's, it's happened in the past, if I get a couple of adjudications that I happen to not agree with, mm -hmm. I'm no longer recognised the validity of this court, not only am I opting out, mm -hmm. I'm also removing my funding, so it's a power... But, but, but it's under, your model, under your model, if, if someone doesn't want to be a part of it, it essentially then does become a government model, doesn't it? Because they're, they're fined or penalised in some no, other way. No, because the, 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 the government are not setting the rules. The government are not setting the ways and means. It is, despite Julian's comment, in my view, an industry-led body. It can have community representatives on it. But if the industry want to self-regulate, if the industry don't want to go along the path of government statutory authority that is, you know, may occur in the UK, was recommended in the Independent Media Inquiry in Australia by Finkelstein. If they want to go down the self-regulatory self path, they have to take it seriously. Mm. And one of the ways that we think that is, is with membership. John no, Rosser, what's, wrong, what's wrong with that I, I think uh, this argument about self-regulation is a misnomer. Uh, whether it's the government telling you what to write and what to say or whether you have some media proprietors telling other media proprietors what to say and do, that's that ultimately self-regulation. Is, is that really what we're talking about here? No, no, it is. No, because if we're saying we have self-regulation, it has some journalists, some members of the profession, some proprietors, some, media, some members of the community telling others what to say and what to do. Well, they're not telling the, them what to say and do. Yeah, effectively. Well, no, why have it then, David? I mean, it's a bit akin to it's telling Dracula them what being they can in charge of the blood bank to put the media coercion. industry in charge mean, of its own self-regulation. If they what came out with a code of conduct, it would go into the bottom drawer and stay there. But, I spent a year of my life, actually, in a government inquiry and the old, your predecessors on the authority, 
inquiring into violence on television following the Havel Street massacre and a few of those things. A year of our life, chaired by a judge. And out came this wonderful document at the end of it, and everybody said, oh, we can't have anybody telling anybody else to do it. The industry will have to regulate it. I would defy any journalist in this country to have ever seen that document <laughs> called The Code of Behaviour, Grief Invasion, all sorts of things. Journalists would laugh at that, and their employers would laugh at that. Well, I mean, it's an, it's, a, it's, it's an ephemeral thing, this whole idea of press freedom, because so people, people will just laugh at any attempt to control them, tradition. even though they'll all run around saying, oh, yes, we're going to uphold standards, but... This just know. shows how powerful the, the media is, that we're all here talking from the perspective of the media. Let's put it back on the other side, what uh, Richard was talking about. These you know, three instances of people whose lives have been just about ruined, mm -hmm. um, the media can look at that and say, oh, well, that's too bad, that was last week, you know, we don't do this very often, you know, a speed well, What do you think should way. happen in those cases? Is that the specifics that, uh, that Richard talked about. What should happen? Well, if the media was capable of regulating itself like a profession, if it wasn't just a bunch of um, desperados who'd write anything to get in, you know, uh, to reach deadline, then... <laughs> if, uh, I'm not... Uh, present company excluded. <laughs> most, of the, of speech. most of the, most of the um, profession excluded. Then um, there would be some mechanism that actually said, that's the scandal, that's what we'll focus on. Let's go and look at Channel 9 for doing this. Why isn't that sort of the subject of, you know, a big story for a week. Instead, what you get was, oh, well, whoosh, that was last week. Now, so no, if, if, so if it should be naming and shaming by the other media, they, by the rest of the media, that, well, that's, that's the if recourse you would suggest. If they took any um, interest in the misdeeds of their colleagues that actually hurt people, that is, then they have that some is, claims... That is happening. Not, there is a lot of analysis. I mean, the Australian has media, a go at the ABC, media, the ABC There's a lot of public consciousness about media and its failings, and there is a lot of deconstruction of everything, like all the cases that, uh, that Richard uh, raised here on the invasion of privacy. And, and George, since uh, Hoddle Street, uh, there's been a higher sensitivity about invasion of, into private grief. Uh, uh, I don't in think it but he referred to the code of conduct. They, they may not have, but <laughs> what I'm saying is that these things, like uh, press council adjudications over the years, that did have, if people got uh, uh, pinged in a press council, in an adverse press council adjudication, that may af affect their standards as a journalist, hopefully to lift it, because uh, they've, been, uh, they've been brought so to all account. All these things are in the code of conduct now. There are rules in relation to broadcasting industry about privacy, and for print as well. All of these things exist. There is... You know, a one wonderful man's, code one of man's conduct, standard is another and it man's is free reign. In incredibly the, widely ignored. I don't think a lot of journalists actually know what it is. It's an argument Chris. between what do you favour? Do you favour remedying abuses of free speech by coercion, or do you favour remedying abuses of free speech by more free speech? Now, the, how, you may laugh. You may laugh. I'll tell you how. The, the, the Australian how free speech help you? The Australian has been running a series of reports speech. about abuses of free speech by the ABC. The ABC retaliates and writes stories about the Australian. Now, what's the problem with that? Chris, That's those are two very powerful organisations. Very powerful organisations. There are a huge number of other people who don't have that free, freedom of speech in practical terms. I'm interested in practical free speech, and I'm, so interested, and I'm interested in free speech for the full range of the community. And if some people, powerful people, and I'm not referring to the, the two organisations you've mentioned, I'm speaking more broadly, if some people exercise their freedom of speech uh, in a way which is excessively abusive and uh, vitriolic and dominates uh, the media that's available, then that's depriving other people of freedom of speech. Also, if people in exercising their freedom of speech misrepresent, misrepresent facts or misrepresent what people have said, that is derogating from freedom of speech. It's true of almost Almost every freedom, I think in fact of every freedom, that absolute freedom usually erodes itself. Mm. We, Julian, we I, Julian you know. I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> uh, the idea that there's practical freedom of speech, what you're talking about is power. We understand the media is powerful and that's why the government wants to control it. The point of freedom of speech is not for someone to say, you have a lot, you have little. I'm saying freedom nothing about the government. For everyone. I'm, I'm saying nothing about the government. So this is being but much you want more... To regulate, this, you've just said... This, this is, is being much more widely recognised in, in the United States, which is the bastion of a free approach, where many people are realising and saying explicitly, many people who are early entrants into blogging and into online are recognising that without a degree of um, civility and, uh, and regulation 
opposition and rules. And this is true of any form of freedom. It, it erodes itself if it's excessive. There are freedoms and other values to be, to be weighed up together. And uh, that's part of the lesson we learn here. We see it at the press council all the time, really, where one person's freedom of speech can erode another person's. Uh, and it's a delicate balance. But there are also other values of privacy. After all, privacy is really a freedom to express oneself in private, not in public. So it's a freedom of expression as well. Paul Jones, I'd like to bring you in on the, you. these issues of uh, privacy. How do you think they should be dealt with? I, I, can, we, can we wind back to the, to the anxieties that the people with experience in electronic journalism have had here? I think this goes back, and George's experience is fascinating, the experience of a failed regulatory initiative. That is the Australian story. We've never done the proper regulation of commercial journalism in Australia that the Brits did with Ofcom. We, do, we don't get the kind of excesses that Richard's been talking about. There's, there's no tradition of tabloid television current affairs in Britain because they've got proper fairness and impartiality codes. There's no economic incentive to keep producing this stuff so the problem doesn't keep coming up the way it keeps coming up here. Mm. The problem it's a very different <laughs> television environment though isn't it? It's, it's not predominantly a commercial television environment. It is for, it's got quite a few com yeah. commercial yeah. channels yeah. but they, they're given very much stronger public service obligations and commercial television news is outsourced you don't have an, a, a coincidence of ownership and news production. That's one of the key innovations the Brits have done which we've never tried here which would be quite fascinating. Oh. Paul, Paul mentioned partiality. Uh, that's, this is, that's really a hornet's nest if we wanted to get, go down that path. I mean, if, if a hornet can go down a path. But it, <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, we, we know that certain that our media organisations, both well, the three of them, print, you know, audio, visual and audio, radio, we know that they're not, partiality is a, anybody's definition of partiality and bias, etc. Mm. And subjectivity is distinct from objectivity. But we don't, we don't want to go there because in this country we have this crazy idea that whether it's 2GB radio, the Australian, the Sydney Morning Herald, or your program or programs that I've worked on, that somehow or other television networks, newspapers and radio stations are really seeking balance everybody's point of view, garbage. I mean, in, in Europe and the UK, for instance, and to some extent America, you go to a certain outlet to get a certain sort of point of, point of view. You don't go to Fox News to expect some screaming left-wing view of the world. You know. mm. And similarly with that. And, and you know what you're getting. In this country, I think we're very naive and immature in the whole media climate in that we think, somehow or other, that whether it's the Daily Telegraph in Sydney, the Age in Melbourne, a radio station that's got a bunch of shock jocks, or Radio National, or your program, or, dare I say it, what calls itself Current Affairs on the Commercial <laughs> Networks, are all striving for balance. They couldn't care less. Well, uh, Richard, do you agree with that? Do you, no, think, do you think people expect an agenda from the various men they go to? I don't think the codes of conduct as such should be overly fussed about bias as an issue. Mm. I think you should be entitled to be biased. You should be have mm. ratbag opinions or, or, you know, sensible opinions. I think uh, there is a, a provision in the Broadcasting Code, as I understand it, that does seek for um, putting an offsetting point of view. So yes, if Alan Jones yeah. is rabbiting on about climate change or something, in his point of view, <clears throat> there is an obligation to occasionally let someone else, the other bloke, have a, have a say. But um, I think, as far as I'm, I can see the codes of conduct, they do not inhibit people to be able to state their biases and their prejudices. Well, Glenn, yeah. do, you, do you think there's an issue here? Should, should there be any uh, rules around bias? Should the media be entitled oh, oh, to be biased? I think impartiality is almost impossible to regulate. But, mm. but accuracy, you can regulate too. Mm. Uh, transparency, you can measure. So these are things that, you know, you can have a point of view on the extreme. But I don't know how to tell you this, Glenn, but the different journalists have a different idea of what, what a fact is. <laughs> So don't worry about partiality. Mm. Even factual journalism, we could argue, Clinton, could uh, Clinton and I could argue about what a fact is. Before we leave privacy, there's, yeah. there's something really, <clears throat> I think, important for, for journalism with the proposed tort of privacy, a statutory tort of privacy that was recommended by the Law Reform Commission and there's an issues paper that the government did on it. And, I mean, I'm, I've cited those examples about breaches of privacy in relation to television current affairs shows, and they were they were all shocking. <clears throat> At the same time, though, if you have your mic, oh, my mic's gone. If you have a statutory um, um, <laughs> obligation for privacy, a statutory tort of privacy, that that um, I'll just put that on. Well done. Live that, television. That, 
gives the power of an injunction, gives the court an injunction. This is a really powerful thing. It means what happens in general, and we've seen it now with the legislation in relation to court suppression orders. These just are handed out like confetti now, and previously the courts didn't have a bit of legislation that gave them that power. If you have a statutory, if you have a tort of a remedy for privacy mm. that has an injunction in it, this is a big problem because what happens, you ring a person up, we're writing a story about you, it's coming out tomorrow, we'd like your comment. The first thing they do is go to the court exactly. and say, and the court will close it down, even if months later well, it's found not to be a quick response from David privacy. on that one. But I, I think that's a problem for the media. That's yeah. only if you have the sort of the crude cartoon version of this that basically says any breach of privacy is subject to the court stepping in and saying, OK, we can't do that. Um, all of the versions I've seen, the, the, the test is actually very high. It's for, a, you know, an extreme abusive... Uh, I know, but at the uh, threshold level, if, if someone... At, Seven o'clock at night gets a phone call. They're worried about this story about them. They will get their solicitor to go straight up to the yep. to the duty judge and, and, and get an interim injunction. And a robust judge with a well written law would look at the law and says this is an extreme thing when there's there's I essentially no, no, I no public interest involved. <laughs> so you you are someone who's in the public figure. There's a, there's a scandal breaking yeah. around this. This is you not look at the way they're handing out these suppression orders now in in no, uh, no, no, no publication orders. Yeah. The, it's a, it's it really is scary. And you do have to be careful that that you, you're not uh, you know setting up a minefield there. But mm. you know. Uh, it is possible to, to be very, very clear that this is not well, for trivial matters. This is not to allow celebrities, politicians, how do you businessmen to do that. Well, you, you basically say that this is, um, you know, if, if there's a, a legitimate public interest mm. in doing this, which is prima facie there, if it's, a, if it's a story about some public sort of process happening, government or business or, or whatever... What about celebrity, you, you celebrity journalism? The whole industry of celebrity mm. journalism is based on uh, okay. commercially exploitable voyeurism. And this <laughs> is what, what uh, Rupert, uh, Rupert and his various publications around the world as uh, cash in on, as do, that's right. as do others. It's, and that's the that, hard that, case. That, that's, that's the one that's, that's most, most difficult that's, to work that's, out. That's uh, but... telephoto lenses of uh, paparazzi. Right. Well, let's, 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 paparazzi let's, for let's, let's, really let's, let's do privacy David. laws. Yeah, we're, we're quite are. different to standards that, mm. because there's another issue. Uh, but if we haven't finished with, if we have finished what with we, privacy, what I we want are to going to do Glenn is take something. a very quick break and then come back because I think this privacy issue is clearly uh, quite an interesting one. But we're also going to look at some of the other recommendations in Glenn's report. Stay with us.